Hi, I'm Miranda Cosgrove, and this is Mission Unstoppable. Coming up, we've got the cutest, I mean, most ferocious, desert cats. They're successful hunters of a venomous sand viper. This guy can take it down a sand viper? Yeah. No way. Then, is this a face? Your brain probably thinks so. Look at this peach with eyes. You trust her, right? And we're crafting robots. Have I got a project just for you. Then, meet a woman making handbags out of bacteria. Get ready to meet the scientists, inventors, and heroes who help make our world a better place. The future is here. The mission unstoppable. Listen, we all love the standard house cat, but sometimes you want to see a cat with upgraded features. We sent Nabil to find out more. No water, no food, no shelter. I think this might be the end for me. And I've been here like about 45 seconds. Man, how do animals survive in such extreme conditions? To find out more, I'm about to meet with Heather Down, animal care curator at the Living Desert Zoo and Gardens. I grew up in the desert out here in Southern California, and my fifth grade teacher themed our curriculum to be marine science based. And from there, my love and passion for the natural world and for animals just took off. But then I realized that the desert ecosystem needs help, it needs attention, it needs focus. It's a world that we know little about. And so then I started to cater my career to understanding the deserts a little bit more. Now Heather is part of a team taking care of 600 desert-dwelling animals from all over the world, including one of the fiercest predators on planet Earth, the black-footed cat. No, really, she is. Today we're gonna meet and hang out with Aria. Hi, Aria. So she is smaller than I was expecting. Yeah, so black-footed cats are actually one of the smaller small cat species. How can these cats survive in such extreme conditions? So when you think of deserts, you think of desolation and harsh environments, but there's actually an array of unique species that call deserts home and they're adapted to extreme environments. So black-footed cats don't really have to drink water very often. So they're gonna get their hydration from the prey that they are eating, which is pretty cool. Wow. Black-footed cats are just one of 33 small cat species who make their home in the desert, which means these tiny predators can make a big impact on their ecosystems all around the world. So what do they hunt? Black-footed cats are gonna go for your small birds, they're gonna go for small rodents and mammals, lizards, as well as the occasional snake. Wow. They are an incredibly fierce hunter and very successful in their foraging strategies. Out of every 10 attempts, six of those are gonna elicit a reward. Wow. Yeah. That is a very high success rate. Yes. She has a good relationship with humans. Yes. What got us to that point? So from a young age, we start to interact with our animals. So we can start to train them for participation in their own health care. So she's trained for voluntary weight. So we can weigh her weekly. We can train her to go into a crate so if we need to take her in for an exam. Heather hopes to keep Aria in tip-top form because as a species, black-footed cats are vulnerable to extinction. It's estimated there are less than 10,000 left in the wild, which makes a conservation program like this critically important. So the goal of this facility is to make more of these cats, to put a plane with. Yeah, there's only about 23 black-footed cats in our American zoos. And so she has a really important responsibility to not just you know be happy, but also to go on and help breed so we can have that population of sustainability. So are there other types of cats in this facility? There are. You want to go meet a sand cat? Yeah. All right, let's go. While black-footed cats are native to Africa, sand cats can be found in the wilds of both Africa and Asia. I'd like to introduce you to Napoleon. Hi, Napoleon. So he's a sand cat and he's about 10 years old and has had four kitten offspring. Uh -huh. Yeah, so this species is found in the Saharan Desert and they're actually camouflaged. So if you check out his coat, you can see that he's gonna be the color of sand. He actually has really furry uh, bottom feet and that's gonna serve as insulation when he's out walking around on the hot desert sand. 
I'm noticing a wider head here, some floppy ears. Uh, do those come in handy out in the desert? They actually have an extremely large ear canal. This allows them to hear scratching of mice and rodents in the burrows, and you can seek out and hunt that prey. So what's their diet? So they're gonna eat your small lizards, your small rodents, mice, small rabbits. They're successful hunters of a venomous sand viper. This guy can take down a sand viper? Yeah. No way. That's pretty cool. Very cool. It's clear that this guy has a pretty good here, but what are some threats to the safety and security of sand cats in their natural habitats? Unfortunately, it's humans, but we can also be the solution. Sand cats are losing habitat, which is detrimental for a species that likes to roam areas up to 120 square miles. By protecting their valuable desert ecosystems, we can make a positive impact, not just for sand cats, but for many types of small desert cats all around the world. Heather, thank you so much for teaching me about small cats and all they do to survive in the desert. I'm actually gonna take some of their advice when I go on my own desert trek. Where are you going? Oh, just to the parking lot. It's so hot out, it's like 120 degrees. Do you have any snacks, by the way? Not on me. Oh, okay, you know what? I'll just scavenge. I'll go sand cat mode. Good luck. Bye, Nabil. Bye, Heather. If you're seeing faces right now, well, I mean, I am on camera. But also, it could be your brain playing tricks on you. Our favorite neuroscientists can't explain. Do you ever feel like you're being watched? Cars, houses, vegetables? Why does it seem like everything has a face and it's looking at me? Surprise, that feeling is coming from your brain. Hi, I'm Dr. Brain. Okay, my real name is Crystal Dilworth, but I have a PG in neuroscience, which is easier to call me Dr. Brain. So, I'm, I'm Dr. Dr. Brain! Vision dominates the way we make sense of our world, and it has the ability to capture our other senses, meaning that what we see has the ability to override information like what we're tasting and hearing. For instance, a red velvet cupcake doesn't taste like chocolate, because it looks red. But here's a secret. It's flavored with cocoa powder, just like your favorite brown chocolate cake. I have more baking tips, but they want me to stick to like brain stuff mostly, so maybe next time. Faces are incredibly important sources of visual information. Facial expressions of other people can tell us if we're in trouble and should run, or if the person we're looking at is distressed and needs our help. Neuroimaging studies reveal that some cells in our brains and those of other social primates like monkeys have larger responses to faces than to other types of visual information. We even have a special part of our brain in the lateral portion of the mid-fusiform gyrus called the fusiform face area. Yeah, I agree. Scientists need to get way better at naming stuff. Cells in the fusiform face area are dedicated to recognizing the patterns of faces. They're the cells that tell us that this is a face that we need to pay attention to, but this is just an object, even if it looks like it gives good advice. Face pareidolia is what scientists call the perception of facial features on an otherwise inanimate object. It's a natural error of face detection. Our brain's making a mistake about the meaning behind what we're looking at. Is this a face? I think it is. I don't trust it. Differences in facial features help us identify who we're talking to and easily determine if there's someone we know or who we've never met before. Damage to the fusiform face area can cause a condition called face blindness or prosopagnosia. It's a condition where you struggle to recognize faces or you can't interpret facial expressions and cues and it can have a very negative impact on their ability to interact socially. Faces and expressions improve communication and empathy between people and even between humans and non-humans. Look at this peach. Pretty normal, right? Now look at this peach with eyes. You trust her, right? The same concept even works with robots. Humans are more willing to trust and work closely with robots if they have qualities of a human face on them. 
So you can expect to see a lot more facial features on all kinds of service technologies, from vending machines to those cute little delivery robots. Showing our face to the world can be scary, but it allows others to connect with us, and they make us feel more empathy for the person behind the face. It may be one of the most important factors for survival and communication of our social species. And the faces we see impact our behavior, our emotions, and our decision-making, even when they're not real. When you're out there showing your face to the world, remember, we're hardwired to see each other and connect. So make friends with that tomato in your salad or the cardboard on the street. Even objects like to feel seen. Some people show love with words of affirmation. Other people show love with acts of service. And still, others make a little robot guy. Let's learn how to do that. Do you ever wish you could send your best friend secret messages? What about secret messages in a cute little box that you coded, crafted, and lovingly hand-delivered to your BFF? Well, great. Have I got a project just for you. Hi, I'm Christina. I'm a software engineer by trade, but a crafting enthusiast in my heart. And I want to teach you the magic behind arts and crafts and coding. Let's get building. Not only is crafting a fun way to exercise your creativity, research from the past decade has also shown that crafting can help improve your mood. It's also a super cute way to get gifts for your besties. And that's what I want to do today. We're gonna build a Morse code message in a box for my best friend, Jackie. Morse code was made in the 1830s as a way of sending messages electronically over telegraphs. You use dots or dashes to represent letters or numbers. To make a Morse code message, you'll need this. It's your microcontroller. These are basically little computers that we can use to program robots. To do that, you'll also need this. It's called a breadboard. It's a solderless circuit board. Let's start by building our light circuit. Take your LED bulb. LEDs are light-emitting diodes. Do you see how one leg is longer than the other? That long one is the anode, which is also commonly referred to as the positive end. This is the end that brings power into the light bulb. This shorter leg is a cathode, or negative end. This is the end that helps electricity flow out of the light bulb. Think of diodes as one-way streets for our current. Current always needs to travel from the positive pole to the negative pole. If you reverse the polarity and try to make it run negative to positive, your bulb won't light up. So we're going to place the LED in the breadboard and then connect our wire source to it. You want to connect the wire source in the same row as the anode or positive end. Then connect that wire to our microcontroller. This will be our power source. Now, we'll add a resistor. As you can guess from the name, resistors resist the flow of current. That can be a good thing when you have too much current, like changing a hose from full blast to a gentle stream of water. By resisting current, the resistor keeps us from burning out our LED. After current flows through our resistor, it wants to go home, back to ground on the microcontroller. This will create a closed loop so that current can keep flowing through our circuit and powering our LED. Okay, now it's time to see if we can light this bulb up. Plug your microcontroller into the laptop. Then open up the coding program. We need to say exactly how many milliseconds to keep the light on for. For a Morse code dot, we'll tell the computer to keep the light on for 300 milliseconds. For a dash, we'll say 1,000 milliseconds, which equals one second. I want to code the letters JV. Now let's see if this worked. And there it goes. This is a J. And there's our V. You can personalize this code to any of the letters or numbers on the Morse code alphabet. Start with simple letters like your initials, then work your way up to more complex sentences like love you or should we all wear pink on Wednesdays? Now that the robot is blinking like we want it to, it's time to craft. Get a box and your decorated material. You'll also want to build a little window. I'm gonna go with a heart shape here, but you can personalize it to anything. You know how to glue paper to cardboard. You don't need to see all this. But through the magic of TV, here's the finished box. 
Isn't this so cute? My bestie will love this. I bet you thought building your first robot was gonna be hard. Turns out, it's not so bad, right? I'll see you next time for more arts and crafts and coding. Some superheroes put on capes and save the world, but some heroes save the world by making the capes or other textiles. I'm not gonna be picky about it. Today, I'm at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. To make it here, you have to have a bold vision, an eye for style, and lots and lots of microbes. To find out what bacteria has to do with fashion, today, I'm gonna to be talking to Dr. Theon Shiros. So, I certainly never thought I'd have a career or be working in fashion, so to speak. Really, I am a scientist first and foremost, but in truth, STEM has everything to do with fashion. All the clothes we wear were engineered. You engineer stretch, you engineer color, you engineer waterproofing. These are all engineering and chemical principles applied. To show us how these principles come together, I need Theanne to spill the tea, sweet tea to be exact. So I have to ask you, what is that? This may very well be our fiber factory of the future. It smells like tea. Uh, it's sweet tea, and those sweet tea are feeding bacteria, and those bacteria are spinning us new materials. Wow. Deanne explains how her lab uses microbes, yeast, and bacteria to create fiber for a leather alternative, all part of her research focusing on designing and engineering new environmentally conscious materials to reach climate goals. A lot of people don't realize the impact that fashion has on the environment, and that's where sustainability comes in. Indeed. She and her students hope their microbe-grown materials will turn the fashion world upside down in the future. So here we are. Wow, this is really cool. So what are we looking at here? Well, I set up a little bit of a process biofabrication so we can kind of see the moving parts of how we go from microbe to textile. That process, the Ann shows me, starts with feeding the bacteria a carbon source, which is the sugar, and a nitrogen source, which is the tea. And as the bacteria eats, it creates cellulose, which sits atop the liquid as a hydrated biofilm called a pellicle. I think it looks like skin. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Leather comes to mind, right? Yeah, it, it does come kind to of mind. It looks like a hide. And just like how animal hides need to go through a tanning process before it becomes leather, this pellicle needs to go through a plant based lecithin emulsion process before it becomes. This Voila! Yeah. But this is sort of the base bio leather. It looks it looks and feels amazing. Can I see some of the yes. things you've made? Yeah, these are just a few examples of what we made. We have a little card holder here, a clutch, um, some mini bags. So really, the bio leather can it can be used in so many ways. I guess that traditional leather has been used. Yeah, and the idea is to do all of those same things with a significantly lower environmental and human health impact. I feel like one of these days I'm going to see these products on the runway. Well, if that happens, you'll be sure to have a seat right up front in the cultured section with the microbes. <laughs> Good one. Welcome back. Before we go, we have one last thing. My advice to girls who want to pursue a career in STEM is to believe in yourself, stay focused, and most importantly, to have fun. Sometimes the seat at the table isn't there, make the seat. Pull out the chair and sit at the table. That's it for Mission Unstoppable. Tune in next week when we find out why chemists are such great problem solvers. It's like they have all the solutions. Bye. If you're watching this, you must have really liked the video. Make sure you follow and subscribe and check out these other videos that are even better. No, really, I've seen this one over a hundred times.